20 years ago today, corporate America changed forever. Enron filed for bankruptcy December 2nd, 2001. At the peak of its success, the company's shares were worth more than $90 each. But just before Enron filed for Chapter 11, they traded at 26 cents. The scandal that followed was epic. It made household names out of previously obscure business executives. And it made the careers of the team that prosecuted them. Scott Cohn covered Enron for CNBC 20 years ago. And tonight he's reporting on where they all got started in Houston. Hi, Scott. Uh, hi, Shep. December 2nd, 2001, the day of the bankruptcy was a Sunday. The very next day, Monday, 4,000 Enron employees were thrown out of work, many of them onto the street behind me. Ultimately, more than 20,000 had their careers uprooted. Many lost all their retirement savings. The people at the top lost their dignity. They became national villains. Some went to prison. For the man at the very top, it was a sudden and total fall from grace. What are you going to work on? Ken Lay was more than just the founder of Enron. He was a local hero in Houston, politically connected. Many expected he was bound for Washington, but not like this. I'd say you were a carnival barker, except that wouldn't be fair to carnival barkers. Indicted on 10 felony counts, he said he was shocked when he was convicted on all of them. I firmly believe I'm innocent of the charges against me. Just six weeks later, awaiting sentencing, he died of a heart attack, effectively wiping out his convictions. In a statement provided exclusively to CNBC on the 20th anniversary of the bankruptcy, Lay's son and daughter focused on what he built. The model was simple. Hire the smartest people you could find, give them capital, and manage the back office for them so they could build new markets. Former CEO Jeff Skilling created Enron's business model. His sudden resignation in 2001 raised some of the first suspicions. Released from prison in 2019 after serving 12 years for fraud, conspiracy, and insider trading, today he's back in Houston working on a high-tech startup in the energy industry and volunteering. He declined to comment. Andy Fastow, the former chief financial officer who cooked up Enron's most notorious off-balance sheet deals and got rich in the process, would eventually plead guilty to two fraud counts, testify against his former bosses, and serve five years in prison. In a statement, Fastow says he believes what he did was wrong, unethical, and was illegal. He's ashamed and embarrassed, takes full responsibility, and he apologizes. Today, as seen in this promotional video, he gives speeches on business ethics. His message, even though companies may believe they're following the rules, the same misleading deals he did at Enron are still common in business. It's a strange phenomenon where you can follow all the rules and yet still be committing fraud. I would say that he's definitely rationalizing. Leslie Caldwell, the first head of the Justice Department's Enron Task Force, would go on to head the DOJ Criminal Division. Today, she's a white-collar defense attorney. Certainly, there's still accounting fraud going on. What's very rare to see, especially in established large companies like Enron, is a fraud that's driven from the top of the company. Her successor as Task Force Director Andrew Weissman would go on to be a top aide in the Mueller investigation. Deputy Director Kathy Rumler became White House Counsel under President Obama. Now she's General Counsel at Goldman Sachs. And overseeing it all, then Deputy Attorney General James Comey. Some critics say the task force, created as the Bush administration was facing political fallout of the, over the president's ties to Ken Lay, became a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, fundamentally unfair, they say, to many of those convicted. Some cases, most notably the one that put accounting firm Arthur Anderson out of business, were overturned on appeal. But alumni of the task force remain proud of their work. And what about this place, Houston, which lost a lot of its swagger 20 years ago today? Well, it's more than recovered. There have been a few mentions of this anniversary on local news, but there is now a whole generation that knows next to nothing firsthand about what happened in the building behind me and the massive impact it had worldwide. Shep? Scott Cohn, live in Houston.